great. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Nicola Mazzari from EPFL here in Lausanne. Uh, and uh, I have uh, the great pleasure of having here today in remote, but uh, you know, very much uh, present, uh, Professor uh, Christian Thusen uh, from uh, the Technical University of uh, Denmark uh, in uh, Lingby, uh, that uh, will present uh, some of his uh, exciting works uh, on, uh, say, in this case, emergent properties in Flatland, uh, when uh, one plus one is uh, more than two. Now, before introducing uh, Christian, uh, let me also just uh, mention in passing uh, that we have uh, uh, two more uh, Marvel Distinguished Lectures forecast uh, for the rest of the spring. Uh, it will be Professor uh, Claudia Felser from the Max Planck in Dresden on May 2nd and uh, Professor Emmanuel Kupakis on June 20th from the University of uh, uh, Michigan, uh, always at uh, 3 p.m. Now, I have to say I have uh, the pleasure of knowing uh, Christian, uh, I think, uh, for more than he actually remembers. That will be a topic uh, for the sort of questions later on. But uh, uh, Christian obtained uh, his uh, PhD in 2005 at the DTU. Uh, he was then a postdoctoral associate in uh, Freie University in Berlin for uh, one year. Uh, and then he went uh, back uh, to Denmark, to DTU, where he uh, rapidly sort of became assistant, associate, uh, and uh, full uh, uh, professor. And uh, in particular, in, in the last years, he also heads uh, the section for uh, computational atomic scale materials design, uh, CAMD, uh, that I would say had given so much uh, to the electronic structure community, and in particular is also the home, I would say, or where most of the development is done, uh, both for the GPO electronic structure code uh, and for the uh, atomic simulation environment, uh, ASE. Uh, Christian interest uh, span uh, density functional theory, time-dependent density functional theory, many body perturbation theory, uh, a special focus uh, to materials in low dimension that uh, will be the topic uh, of today. And I would say also very much recently that the driven approaches uh, to materials design and the uh, high throughput uh, workflow. So, so with this, uh, Christian, thanks again for accepting and uh, looking very much forward uh, to your talk. Thank you very much, Nicola. And I will... Try to share my screen here. Okay. Can you see the slides? All, all good. Perfect. Okay, good. So uh, welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining. Thanks to Nicola for, for the opportunity and uh, thanks to the rest of the uh, Marble Consortium. So as, as Nicola said, I'll be talking about our research uh, on uh, data-driven discovery and exploration of emergent properties in 2D materials. And uh, I hope that the slightly cryptic part of this of this title will be clear as we uh, as we go along. So uh, this talk is about two dimensional materials, and that's a class of materials that uh, I've been attracted to for for many years now. And uh, this stems not just from, from the fact that these materials are the thinnest possible uh, type of, of materials you can imagine, but also from the fact, and even more from the fact that the properties of these low dimensional materials are, are often qualitatively different from the properties of their bulk form. And uh, you know, that's fun for a theoretical physicist because it means that uh, all the, the uh, the theories that we thought we knew that were developed many years ago, they have to be uh, uh, reconsidered uh, when they uh, should apply to two-dimensional materials. So uh, another reason why I find this field very fascinating is because the developments in the this field have been uh, progressing so amazingly quickly. So here I'm just showing some of the uh, uh, milestone discoveries that have taken place and have shaped the field uh, over the past decade. And um, this is just, you know, this is not a complete uh, selection, but just some of the, what I find most, most important. I don't want to talk about all of them, but I want to highlight a few that are more important, uh, most important for this uh, talk. The first one 
is this early discovery um, in 2010 of the fact that um, if you thin down a crystal of molybdenum disulfide to a monolayer, then the band gap changes from indirect to direct. So this is actually also what, what I mean by emergent properties uh, in the title that you have a property of a material that can change qualitatively when you stack it or you, you thin it down by exfoliation. So uh, the other idea or concept I would like to highlight is that of van der Waals heterostructures that, that came up around 2013, um, which really expands the potential um, opportunities that you have with 2D materials. Now you can start with this idea, you can start to stack different two-dimensional materials and you can combine materials with different properties. So you could, for example, take a, a semiconductor and you could encapsulate it in a high dielectric material. And in that way, you could screen out charged impurities, electron phonon coupling, and enhance the, uh, the mobility of electrons in the semiconductor. You could take a 2D semiconductor and put it on a 2D ferromagnet, and in that way, break the time reversal symmetry. One can also use these, these ideas to uh, proximity induce superconductivity or spin-orbit coupling in, uh, in, in semiconductors. Um, so there are really many opportunities. And quite recently, it's also been shown that, that there is yet another parameter one can tune in these materials, and that's the twist angle. So you cannot just stack different 2D materials, you can also twist them relative to each other and thereby induce uh, new properties. As you all know, uh, a twisted bilayer graphene can become superconducting. Um, so that's a, a really new um, material property that you, that you induce in the material in that way. And very recently, it has been demonstrated that the, the stacking order in homo bilayer uh, materials is, is another parameter that one can use to, to induce new functionalities or obtain new functionalities. So in fact, some of these uh, bilayers can exist in different stacking configurations and those stacking configurations can have different properties. So in that way, one can actually create um, interfacial ferroelectrics or other types of, of switchable materials. Then lastly, I would like to mention this um, um, discovery or achievement in, in 2018 by uh, Nicola Masari and, and also other groups, uh, where they computationally exfoliated all the known bulk van der Waals compounds, and in that way sort of um, highlighted um, all the 2D monolayers that could actually be obtained by exfoliation. And it turned out that there are several hundreds of those 2D, uh, 2D materials. And I'll also come back to this uh, later, later in the talk. OK, so um, because of all these fascinating uh, developments, we, uh, we asked ourselves, um, uh, I think now it's about seven years ago, if it would be possible to create a database and really map out all the different 2D materials uh, using ab initio calculations. And this was actually uh, a quite crazy idea, I think. And if we had known how much work and pain uh, it would and frustration that this would have caused, we would probably not have done it at the time. But 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 we did it. And uh, I just want to uh, to say a little bit about the, the 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 database we created in that way. So we have two different ways of of creating, generating the structures. One of them is to start from experimentally known uh, crystal structures, and then we uh, substitute the atoms by other types of atoms and create these hypothetical 2D materials, which we can then uh, feed into a workflow that um, checks the stability of the materials, and if they are stable, computes a range of properties. And another approach is uh, what you could call top-down, inspired by the uh, before mentioned work, uh, exfoliate um, computationally monolayers from known layered bulk structures. So that's another way of, of, of populating the database. And now before continuing with the main uh, topic of the talk, I want to make a small um, digression here and say something about uh, high throughput computations and how to manage them using automated workflows because um, the C2D database contains about um, 300,000 DFT calculations, and that's obviously impossible to, 
to manage just with standard scripts. So one needs to have a more systematic approach to this. And, and uh, that's where these automated workflow solutions come in. Um, and here is a, a figure that I've learned from Giovanni Pizzi that shows how complicated such workflows can actually look. Um, this is from the Yaida uh, workflow uh, engine. So we need these workflows to submit the calculations automatically, uh, obtain the results, uh, store them in databases, and keep track of all the metadata that documents the calculations and allow us to reproduce them uh, at a later time. <clears throat> and what we've been doing since uh, 2017, um, around that time, is to develop a Python framework for, for workflows that we call the Atomic Simulation Recipes, ASR. And as the name suggests, this is very much inspired by the atomic simulation environment um, that I'll say a little bit about uh, in a minute. So the first version of ASR was developed by Morten Gerding, and this really came out of the development of the C2DB uh, database. Um, the ASR was then, a new version of ASR was then made uh, by S. Glassen. He's been working on that for the last couple of years. So this is a much improved version of it. And this is also work that has been uh, performed within the Nomad Center of Excellence. And finally, I want to mention Jens Jörn Mortensen, who is also the main developer of the GPO code. He has developed uh, the MyQ um, system, which is actually a front end to uh, batch job schedulers like Slurm and, and PBS uh, that makes it simple to submit calculations and get an overview of all the jobs you have in the queue. And ASR uses MyQ to, uh, uh, to integrate with the, um, with the job scheduler on, this, on the supercomputer. So here are the uh, main components of, of the ASR um, Python framework. So as you can see up here, um, we use ASE as an interface to the atomistic simulation codes. And uh, ASE is a Python library, a, a Python environment for working with atoms and, and simulations. It's a strongly community-driven project, um, very active, and it has interfaces to about 30 different uh, simulation codes. And um, actually, these days, we, we have a hackathon um, going on here at PTU, where we're working on the interfaces between ASE and a number of different electronic structure codes, because um, those interfaces need to be improved if we are to, you know, improving those will just make it a lot easier to switch from one DFT code to another uh, within ASE, and that would be uh, uh, great to be able to do that. Okay, so coming back to the ASR, uh, what I'm showing here is sort of the backbone of the um, uh, of the workflow engine. So the yellow box over here, the yellow component, is um, a collection, a library of uh, task functions. These are simply Python functions that implement small, well-defined computational tasks that could be prepare a structure, like create a point defect in a structure, neatly reduce the structure. It could be a self-consistent DFT calculation, or it could be some post-processing of a DFT calculation. Then we have the workflows, and the workflow is actually a Python class that um, uh, imports task functions and decorate them into tasks. I'll come back to what that means in a minute. And then we have Task Blaster, which is um, the workflow backend. So this is, um, this is the part of the code that handles all the dependencies and, and executes the workflow tasks using uh, the MyQ uh, front end. So if we zoom in on, on Task Blaster a little bit, then, um, you know, as I mentioned, we have the task functions, we can create workflows out of those. Uh, and then if we run the workflow command, what will happen is that uh, Task Blaster creates JSON files that represents the tasks in folders and creates a dependency graph. So these graphs shows the dependencies between all the tasks. And then we have a registry over here, a little SQLite database that relates the um, hashes of these small JSON files to uh, their place in the, in the folder tree. So that's essentially how it works. And uh, this makes it possible to, this makes a very transparent um, um, system because you can go and inspect uh, the different tasks uh, in the folder tree yourself. 
Okay, um, so I should also mention that um, at any point in time, one can collect the database, an ASE database, um, from the uh, calculations that have been uh, run, and then one can show the results in a, in a browser. And um, this is very convenient for following um, the progress of, of a high throughput um, study. And then we also have some functionality for, for data migration and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, coming back to the to the main topic here, this is where we we left it. So now we know how to do high throughput computations in a in a smart way. And um, so now I would like to show you the uh, workflow that we use here to assess stability and properties of the two D crystals. That looks something like this. So the first two columns here is where we relax the structure, check that after relaxation we still have a two D material check whether it's already in the database, classify the, um, the, um, uh, the crystals, stoichiometry, space group, y cup positions, check whether the material is magnetic. Over here, we compute formation energies, energies above the convex hull, the stiffness tensor, and the dynamical matrix. And based on those, we can say whether this material is dynamically stable or not. And if it is stable, we run it through the property workflow that will eventually uh, um, populate the C2DB database with various types of properties. We also have two other databases that we are developing. I'll say more about this uh, bilayer database uh, later in the talk. And then we have a database of uh, intrinsic point defects in the, uh, in the monolayer materials. And these databases are sort of uh, fully integrated with each other. So that, that makes sort of a nice platform for for exploring these 2D materials and, and their various types of properties. Okay, so uh, this is a screenshot from the C2DB. You put in a material that you're interested in, you get a list of materials, you click the one that you're interested in. In this case, this is MOS2 in the standard H space. You get a lot of information about that material, and then you have lots of properties out here that you can um, you know, read about what these, what these, what these properties are and you can click them and you can see the properties. Um, so here's a band structure, here's a Raman spectrum and so on. And I should say that we have recently added a second harmonics uh, generation spectrum and also shift currents, um, as well as um, uh, the spontaneous polarization of crystals that, that uh, qualify as, as having such properties, um, meaning materials that are semiconducting and do not have inversion symmetry. So that's also, uh, available now or will be uh, very soon. I should also mention that we're working with the GPO code. It's being developed. Um, as I mentioned, the main um, developer is here in, in the CAMD section, Jens-Jörn Mortensen. And um, it is an open source uh, project. So there are also developers uh, other places in the world. Uh, you can download it for free. Um, it's based on the PAW formalism for representing the ion course. And um, a, a unique feature that I want to stress here is that it has three different types of basis sets. It has a real space uh, basis set, it has plane waves, and then it has a basis set of uh, atom-centered numerical orbitals, which is very efficient, but maybe not um, as accurate as real space and plane waves. But it means that one can now combine these different types of, of basis sets. So for some applications, plane waves are better, for others, LCAO functions are better. Uh, but one can also combine them and, for example, relax the structure with the LCAO. This is fast. And then one can switch to the plane wave to do the last fine tuning of the structure. Things like that is, is, is possible with the code. So we have uh, a very um, skilled and efficient uh, little group of people here at the moment that are refactoring the response part of GPO and also the excited state part. So um, we, we hope that. Uh, Soon, we will have a new version of GPOL that, that works even better and uh, uh, presents itself even, even better to, uh, to developers and users. I should also mention that GPOL is, is written in Python. Uh, so that makes it uh, quite nice to, to, to read and uh, it's very modular. And so it's also nice to, uh, if you want to do development to work with the code. Okay, so uh, switching gears a little bit now. Um, I mentioned uh, two, essentially two ways of generating uh, crystal structures for uh, computational 
investigations. One is to simply take them from experiment. The other one is to take a prototype crystal structure and then decorate it with different atoms. That, that's pretty straightforward. But as you also know, there's been a lot of, of uh, developments in uh, what is called generative models, uh, AI-based generative models. Uh, these are unsupervised machine learning models that um, learns patterns in data and then can create new data based on that. Um, and just uh, uh, in the simplest form, um, a one type of generative model is, is the variational autoencoder. And in the simplest form, that consists of two neural networks that can, uh, one encodes data into a Latin space and the other one decodes the data uh, back to you know, the real representation. Um, the Latin space does not contain points. It contains distribution. So that's important to realize. Um, so it could look like something like this. And that makes it possible for the, uh, uh, for the system to interpolate between known data. Okay, so that, that's very important in order to arrange the Latin space, the data in the Latin space in, 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 in a good way. Um, the two neural networks here are optimized at the same time by minimizing a loss function that contains two terms. One of them is a reconstruction terms that simply says, how well can we reconstruct the original data? And then there is another term here, which is essentially a regularization that um, ensures that the distributions we get are not sort of distributed too far from each other, which would make it impossible to use um, the lattice space for, for uh, interpolation. So we have, um, or I should say, um, Peter Lyngby uh, from the group has used this particular variational autoencoder, um, which is called crystal diffusion variational autoencoder developed by these guys here. Um, so this is a, a fairly involved uh, generative model. Uh, we have materials over here represented by um, the, uh, the unit cell, the position of the atoms and the type of the atoms. Then this is encoded into a low dimensional Latin space, dimension of around hundred. And then it, instead of just having one uh, decoder neural network, it has sort of an intermediate step where um, there is a predictor that goes from the Latin space and then predicts the composition, the unit cell and the number of atoms. And from this, uh, a random structure is initialized with this composition, lattice, and number of atoms. And then the structure is optimized using a Langevin dynamics, uh, where the forces have been learned during training. And this is done by adding noise to the original structures. And then uh, from those noisy structures, learning um, the direction of the forces and the size of the forces. So by putting all this together, it's actually possible to generate materials. And this was tried by uh, uh, my PhD student, Peter. Uh, so he took uh, about 2,600 stable 2D materials from the database. And then he did two things. Um, to the left here, uh, is show the, the left branch here shows um, the CDDAE, this um, generative model. And so he created 10,000 structures. Uh, some of those were duplicates, so they were removed. Uh, 5,000 were unique, they were relaxed. And then uh, after relaxation, some were again duplicates and removed. Some DFT calculation failed. Some turned into non-2D materials and they were removed. And eventually he ended up with about 3,000 materials after relaxation. He also did uh, sort of lattice decoration of these 2,600 structures. And um, this is interesting, not only as a baseline for the generative model, but also because many of the original monolayers in C2DB were taken from experiments and they had actually not been lattice decorated before. So it also, so this led to um, almost 9,000 new uh, monolayer materials. And I think it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting that the intersection between these two um, uh, sets of materials is only 22. So they seem to be two like, uh, complementary methods for, for generating new materials. So the main question here is, of course, whether the materials we have generated with the generative model are stable. So um, 
The dash curve here shows the uh, distribution of the energy above the convex hull of the training data. And the full distribution here shows the generated data. And we can see that uh, maybe they're not as stable as the training data, but they're sort of, they have relatively low energy above the convex hull. So that's good. Um, but to check this sort of more uh, stringently, we also trained the model on a set of unstable materials. That's the orange curve here that shows the distribution. And then the generated, then we repeated the whole process and the generated data um, are shown down here. And so what we can see is that the model indeed is able to learn the stability because when we train on stable materials, it generates stable materials. When we train on unstable materials, it generate less stable materials. So that's nice. Um, but of course, we would also like the generated materials to show um, some kind of diversity. If they just look like the training data, we haven't really achieved much. So this is a low dimensional plot of a uh, feature representation space where the features are encoding the stoichiometry, the space group, and the Wyckoff position of, of the materials. So it says something about the chemical and structural diversity of the materials here. Um, and the C2DB training data is shown in blue, and um, the machine learning generated materials are shown in green. And what you can see is that the green dots here are indeed um, occupying regions of this space where there, where, where there is no training data. On the other hand, the lattice decorated materials, the orange points, are closer to the, uh, to the training data. So this shows really that the generated materials are occupying sort of new parts of, of the material space. Uh, what we're doing right now, what Peter is doing is, is to calculate the properties of the most stable of these materials. So we have 2000 materials that are within 50 MeV of the convex hull, and we calculate those properties and upload them to, to C2DB. Okay, um, so enough about monolayers. Uh, now I would like to, to switch to multi-layer structures, in particular bilayer structures. Um, so here I'm showing three different classes of multi-layer structures, Van der Waals bonded multi-layer structures. We have the heterostructures where the basic parameters that can be tuned are the type of the 2D materials and the stacking order, the sequence of the layers. Then we have the twisted uh, bilayers, homo bilayers, where the rotation angle is the uh, tuning parameter. And finally, we have these um, aligned homo bilayers, so untwisted bilayers, where we can play with the stacking order. And that gives us sort of a, a parameter that we can tune to optimize the material to some extent. Um, so in this project, we have, we have focused on the um, aligned homo bilayers over here for various reasons. One of them is that they are easy to compute because the unit cell of these structures is the in-plane unit cell is the same as the unit cell of the monolayer, so there are not too many atoms. The other reason is that these materials are actually uh, relatively easy to uh, synthesize. You can in principle exfoliate them from naturally occurring layered bulk structures, um, and they have generally higher quality. And finally, uh, and that's of course also important, they have very interesting properties. And to motivate that, let me give you some examples of such um, aligned homo bilayers and why that could be interesting to study. The first one I already mentioned in the introduction, and that's this, uh, that is the direct indirect transition in MOS2. Um, so this is one example, but um, of course there could be many other examples like this. So there could be uh, an indirect band gap monolayer that when you stack it into a bilayer, you get a direct gap of a different size and so on. Um, here's another example. This is platinum ditselluride, platinum diselenide, that shows a transition from, uh, in the case of platinum ditselluride, from um, a semiconductor with a gap of 0.5 EV in the monolayer to a metallic uh, bilayer and trilayer. Um, similar situation is found for platinum diselenide, although the bilayer is still a semiconductor, although with a, with a smaller band gap. So by stacking these materials, one can play with the electronic type and the size of the electronic band gap. In principle, one could also imagine playing with the, with the magnetic order in these materials, and I'll also come back to that later on. 
Here's another uh, example of why these homo bilayers are interesting. This is uh, uh, showing electrical tuning of interlayer excitons in a, a bilayer of, of MOS2 by an electric field. So by applying an electric field here perpendicular to this, to this bilayer, it's possible to tune the energy of the interlayer excitons. So over here, you can see two excitons, uh, one in blue and one in red, and they are actually uh, related by the time reversal symmetry. So this is a time reversal pair of interlayer excitons, in fact, mixed interlayer excitons, because as you can see, um, the exciton has both an interlayer com uh, component and an intralayer component. And that is actually important because that makes it possible to probe these excitons using, um, using optics. So they have a, a non-zero uh, oscillator strength because of the intralayer component. Okay, but the point here is that one can tune the energy, break this degeneracy by an electric field and tune the energy of, of, the, uh, of the excitons. So here's another example of switching in, in, uh, uh, in a homo bilayer. This is chromium iodide, which is a magnetic uh, 2D material. In this case, we have again two time reversal uh, pairs of antiferromagnetic states. And again, we can break this um, degeneracy by applying an electric field perpendicular to the bilayer. And by doing so, it's actually possible to tune um, the magnetic state from an antiferromagnetic configuration to a ferromagnetic uh, configuration of the bilayer. So with these examples, I hope I've convinced you that it's, it's, um, it's interesting to go beyond the monolayer and systematically explore uh, bilayer systems. Ah, a final example here is, uh, uh, I also mentioned that before, is uh, interfacial ferro ferroelectricity in, in bilayer HBN. So this is showing two stacking configuration, uh, co configurations of HBN, AB and BA. So they are essentially obtained by sliding the upper layer relative to the lower layer. And what you achieve in, in, uh, in effect is that you get a configuration that is essentially the other one flipped around. So because this bilayer here has a broken mirror symmetry, it can have an out of plane dipole, and then you can switch the direction of that out of plane dipole by sliding the material. And in this way, it was, it was uh, uh, demonstrated that one can switch the polarization direction in this material here electrically um, in a very um, you know, reproducible manner here. So that's a little uh, memory device, you can say, made out of a, of a homo bilayer material. Okay, so um, we have uh, two years ago started a project where we wanted to do something like the C2DB, but for uh, homo bilayers. And um, so we wanted to, to construct a property database that should be uh, fully consistent with the C2DB monolayer database and also fully integrated with it. Um, and this is work that has been done by a number of pe people, but I want to, um, to highlight uh, Saha Pakdel here, who has uh, really been the main driver behind the project and without who it was not, had not been possible. Um, so here is the uh, workflow of this bilayer project. We start by extracting about a thousand monolayers from the C2DB. Then we stack those uh, in all possible stacking configurations. Uh, so this is sort of computational stacking. Uh, we obtain uh, almost 10,000 unique bilayers. We determine the binding energies between these um, layers. And um, once we have that, we take the most stable ones, and then we check whether they are slight stable, meaning whether this configuration we have found is actually represented a representing a local minimum on the potential energy surface or whether the material wants to slide. Um, for the 2,500 thermodynamically and slide stable materials, we then compute a number of properties and upload to this, to this database here. So let me tell you a little bit about these uh, binding energy calculations. So here I'm showing you two curves. The way we do them is we take the two monolayers and then we vary the distance between the uh, two monolayers and calculate the binding energy using uh, PBE with a van der Waals. Uh, functional added to it, or Van der Waals uh, D3 correction. And um, 
we get these binding energy curves from which we can obtain the binding energy and the, and the binding distance. So the benefit of this approach is that um, the monolayers are kept in the PV structure, which means that they can be directly compared to the monolayers in the C2DB. And by this approach, we also get the exfoliation force, which is essentially the maximum of the derivative of this binding energy curve. And here are two uh, examples showing uh, cases of very similar binding energy, um, exf uh, exfoliation energy of about minus uh, 24 MeV per angstrom squared, but where the exfoliation force is actually quite different. Uh, so I think it's a nice uh, additional uh, descriptor to have the exfoliation force in addition to the exfoliation energy. So um, we've done that, as, as mentioned, for a lot of bilayers. And this plot is showing a, a distribution of the exfoliation force versus the uh, interlayer binding energy. And here are some known exfoliable materials shown. And um, this pie chart here shows the number of stable stacking configurations we find per monolayer. So there is a, a relatively large fraction here where we only find one stable stacking. Um, but um, for the majority of monolayers, we actually find multiple uh, stable stacking configurations. And this is, of course, interesting with respect to building devices that can be uh, switched between metastable stacking configurations. So let me now uh, return to the question of uh, what is a stable stacking? So um, if you look over here, what we do is we, we take all the possible stacking configurations that we find, and then we take the most stable of those stacking configurations. And then we say um, all stackings within three MeV per angstrom squared of the most stable stacking configuration can be um, um, realized exp uh, experimentally um, with some um, 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 with some luck, uh, we don't know exactly, of course, um, but 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 this is the idea that these are the most stable stacking configurations uh, within three MeV. Um, now, this is not taken out of the blue. This this criterion of three MeV, we have actually um, done quite an extensive um, piece of research to figure that out. So what we've done is we've we've considered about almost three hundred natural van der Waals crystals. And then we've extracted bilayers from those and identified the stacking configuration. And then we calculate the binding energy for such naturally occurring stacking configurations, the binding energy. And then what we do here is we plot the binding energy of the experimentally observed stacking relative to the most stable stacking that we find uh, using our workflow. So you can note that this is a, a, an exponential scale here. So the first bar down here is about 200 bilayers almost, showing that in most of the cases, we actually find the experimentally observed stacking to be the most stable among all this, uh, the, the stackings we find. But you can see there are also a, a finite number of, of, of stackings that uh, are not the most stable stacking, but still observed experimentally. And you know, we put this uh, uh, threshold he here at three MeV. One could make it higher or lower, but with this, we feel this is sort of a, a good compromise where we include most, we capture most of the experimentally observed stackings, uh, and we don't include too many sort of unreasonable um, uh, stackings. You can also see the distribution of all the stable stackings we find with our workflow here, um, the binding energy of those plotted relative to the experimental stackings and the shape of the distributions are quite similar, also indicating that, that this is a reasonably good criterion. So let's take a look at the electronic types that we find. So whether they are um, semiconductors or metals, they are indirect or direct band gap materials. Uh, what you can see over here, when we compare the change from the monolayer to a bilayer, about 15% of the monolayers change the electronic type upon stacking. And among those, we find 126 that have a direct band gap um, and a merchant direct band gap, meaning that the monolayer used to create it um, had an indirect band gap. If we look at the bilayers, we can have a, this distribution shows um, that uh, about 12% of the bilayers, we have uh, two or more stable stackings with different electronic types. 
So that means if we are able to, to, to slide the material between the two different stacking configurations, we actually have a way of, of changing or tuning the electronic type of the material. If we take a look at the electronic band structures, so here I'm just focusing on the band gap, um, then there are essentially two mechanisms that, that um, 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 are at work when we, when we uh, couple two monolayers into a bilayer. The first one is a hybridization effect as illustrated over here that will typically lower the band gap. The other one is a polarization shift that can occur if there is a built-in out of plane dipole in the material. So this is essentially just a electrostatic shift of the bands in the two materials. And what you can see over here to the left is that in this region here to the right, where we have finite dipoles, the uh, change in the band gap from monolayer to bilayer essentially follows the size of that dipole. So that makes very good sense from the, from the sketch over here. If we then zoom in, on the structures to the left, those are the structures that do not have a built-in dipole. So those would be sort of uh, mirror symmetric or almost mirror symmetric structures. We can take a look at the distribution of the band gap changes over here. This is now plotted as a function of the band gap of the monolayer. And uh, from this, we can, we can see that, that uh, you know, the, the, the change in the band gap can, can be quite, quite large. It can be all the way up to one electron volt. Um, and this is driven purely by hybridization in this case. If we look at um, the band gap of different stable bilayers, so bilayers that exist in two different stable stacking configurations, we can look at the, the difference in band gap. They are generally a little bit smaller than the change from monolayer to bilayer. And again, we can distinguish here two, uh, two uh, regions. Here to the right, where we have a difference in the built-in dipole of the bilayers, we have very large um, band gap changes. These are typically uh, stacking configurations where we have a monolayer with a broken mirror symmetry, also called a Janus monolayer. And we, if we stack them in this way with aligned dipoles, there will be a strong built-in dipole. If we stack them in this uh, uh, configuration with similar atoms facing each other, the two dipoles are opposite and there will not be any uh, uh, dipole involved. So there will be here a large change in band gap between these two due to the large change in built-in uh, polarization potential. On the other side here, um, we have the mirror symmetric or almost mirror symmetric bilayers where the change in gap again is driven by hybridization. And these would be uh, uh, structures like the one shown over here. Now, um, Importantly, I'm showing here not P equal to zero, but P approximately equal to zero. And that's because even if the structures looks like this, they can still have a broken inversion symmetry or mirror symmetry. For example, this structure here in its stacking configuration is not perfectly mirror symmetric. So it can have an outer plane dipole. And this is called um, interfacial ferroelectricity when we have materials of this type. And what uh, Sahar has calculated and show, is showing in this plot over here is about 150 uh, bilayers that are slate with slide equivalent. So each plot here represent a pair of bilayers that can be switched between each other by a pure in-plane translation. Um, and you can see that the change in out-of-plane dipole uh, down here it is not very large, but it can actually be uh, some tenth or even hundred of, of uh, milliev. Uh, okay, so the situation is also sketched up here. So we have two different local minima on the potential energy surface, and they are related by a sliding of the upper layer. So here we have uh, the four TMDs. And if we compare to experiments uh, over here, we can see that the experimentally measured uh, difference in the dipole potential is um, one should actually multiply here by two because this is only showing half of the, of the difference in, uh, in potential. So if we multiply by two here, we get around 100, which is very close to what we obtain over here in the calculations. So those are the TMDs, but as you can see, we have lots of other uh, candidate bilayers here that could, um, that could actually show the same effect. So um, ferro um, interfacial uh, ferroelectric switching. 
Okay, so let me move on to, to magnetic properties of, of these materials. Um, so when we have a, a bilayer where the monolayer is magnetic, then the bilayer can show ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic uh, a coupling. And the chromium iodide is actually uh, an example um, that can exist in two stacking configurations with different um, um, with different magnetic order, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. And as I, I demonstrated or showed previously, it's actually possible to electrically switch between these two uh, stacking configurations. Um, again, uh, so Saha has calculated the um, effective interlayer exchange coupling for, um, I can't remember, 500 magnetic bilayer configurations shown over here. Um, the different colors refer to whether the ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic um, uh, configuration is the ground state. But interestingly, over here in this pie chart, you can see that um, 35 of these materials, and chromium iodide is, is, is among them, can actually show this effect of slight switchable ferromagnetic uh, uh, order. So here we are highlighting two materials. We are highlighting those because they uh, actually have a known uh, layered structure. So both of the materials are experimentally known and could in principle be exfoliated. Uh, and the two configurations are related by, uh, by sliding. Um, this one up here um, is a metal with an in-plane magnetic easy axis. This one down, no, sorry, this is a semiconductor with an in-plane magnetic easy axis. And um, the material down here is, is a metal with an out-of-plane magnetic EC axis. Um, there's also some statistics on, on ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic magnetic, uh, uh, configurations in respectively metals and, and semiconductors. Okay, I think I maybe have uh, five minutes uh, more. Is that correct, Nicola? Yeah, I think we are very relaxed, but absolutely. Or would you like me to, to wrap up now? No, we try to finish uh, before, uh, let's say, four, so that uh, people that, you know, have uh, sort of calendars can uh, can do something else, and then we are free for questions. So, so absolutely. Okay. Good. Thank you. So um, just in case that you are not uh, convinced that we're really um, exploring all the possible stacking configurations with, with our workflow here, this is showing the different stacking configurations we find in the case of... Uh, uh, the Janus material, MOSSE. Um, and this is a reference uh, from literature. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see we actually find those plus a lot more. Um, the green shaded area are those that we find up to be within the three MeV uh, stability window as, as explained before. Okay, uh, let me uh, spend five minutes to very quickly uh, tell you about uh, how we have used machine learning to predict GW band structures in 2D materials. So I think most of you are familiar with the fact that uh, EFT is not very good in describing band structures. We need actually to go to many body perturbation theories such as GW. And if we want excitons, we have to also include electron hole interaction and solve the beta salpeter equation. Uh, if we do that, we can get very excellent agreement with experiments, but if we don't, we get very poor agreement here, as shown by this DFT spectrum down here. Um, if we look at uh, agreement with experiments for GW band gaps, we see this is just a, a few examples here, but, but we get very good agreement um, for these four materials uh, uh, for the quasi particle band gap with GW and, and much better than with these other methods here. So we have uh, performed around almost 400 uh, GW calculations for the monolayer materials in C2DB. And um, you can see the uh, GW uh, corrections for occupied and unoccupied states down here. There are about 40, uh, 46,000 quasi-particle energies because we calculate this correction for each individual band in the band structure. And you can see the size is actually significant. It's on the order of electron volts. Um, so the question we asked here was, can we learn the GW correction? So essentially the uh, GW self energy for an individual electronic state using machine learning. And the project of Nikolai Knuskor, who just uh, graduated as a PhD student. And what he did was he developed different types of electronic descriptors 
incorporating matrix elements between um, the DFT um, wave functions here and also incorporating sort of spatial uh, projected uh, information. Um, so he created these feature vectors that really encode the electronic structure from a standard DFT calculation. So these features are invariant on the rotations and choice of unit cell as they should be, and they are fast to calculate compared to the DFT calculation itself. So training uh, a gradient boosting algorithm on these uh, 46,000 GW corrections, we find a mean absolute error on the band energies on the test set of about 0.1 EV. Uh, this is actually better than the accuracy of GW itself when you compare to experiments. So this is very, uh, this is very nice. Um, here are some examples where you can see the full lines are the machine learning GW bands, the, dot, the green dots are the actual GW uh, calculations, so the ground truth in this, in this model here. So we can now generate these uh, machine learning GW bands from the DFT, standard DFT uh, calculation uh, very efficiently and do that for uh, essentially any type of, of 2D material. The model performance is shown here. It's about 0.15 EV per, um, uh, per uh, uh, electronic state, which is um, uh, very good and within the accuracy of GW itself. And I think I'll skip this slide in the interest of time and move to the conclusions here. So I hope uh, um, to have convinced you that both C2DB and this new uh, bilayer database are uh, providing some useful information. It's actually highly curated uh, databases for structure and properties of thousands of monolayers and, and bilayers. Then I've talked about the ASR, the Task Blaster, and MyQ uh, Python workflow frameworks, where the focus is on simplicity, modularity, uh, flexibility, and transparency. And the goal here eventually is to have um, workflows that are um, agnostic to the simulation code. So it's easy to change from one simulation code to another. Um, I've talked about uh, deep generative models for producing uh, stable 2D materials. And finally, machine learning prediction of GW band structures from a, P a PBE calculation. And with that, I would like to thank um, the people I've highlighted, the people here that have been involved in the specific project I've talked about, um, but also a big thanks to, to all of the uh, uh, CAMD uh, group and thanks to the uh, um, funding agencies here. And thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, always a, a pleasure and always very inspiring, uh, you have, uh, you have to say, and very enjoyable, I think. Uh, you know, I think uh, the injecting also the fun, I think, in the research that we are doing uh, on top of the science. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, in the chat, uh, if you would like to ask uh, a question to a speaker, uh, either raise uh, your hand uh, in the participant uh, pane and I'll give you the uh, microphone or if you don't feel, you know, inclined to talk, uh, you can uh, type it. Uh, in the question and answers, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll read it for you. Uh, so I uh, I would say let's uh, let's start uh, with uh, Davide Grassano. I think uh, uh, Patrick needs indeed to yeah exactly. So Davide, you can uh, you can talk yeah. ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Concerning the deep generative model, um, I was wondering if it, that it looks very much like what stable diffusion is doing for the images. And I, I was wondering if you have also implemented or planning to implement um, uh, a, 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 a biasing of the cross attention. Like uh, if you have enough data, for example, you would ask for, for the generative model to pre to bias it toward like se se semiconductor or metals or uh, superconductors. I, I, I don't know if it's uh, you already done that or if it's in... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. We tried that. Um, uh, it turned out to be difficult. We didn't really uh, do any um, uh, changes to the model, but it has a feature that allows you to, to uh, this property prediction in in include other types of properties, for example, band gaps. Uh, so this is something we tried. Um, but we were unsuccessful. So, so it was very difficult to find stable materials with specific band gaps, which is what, what Peter specifically tried to do with this, with this method here. So yeah. 
I'm sorry, but it, it just seems to be a very challenging problem. Um, extremely interesting, but, but so far, no luck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks. And uh, uh, we have uh, Mebare Halwani. I think Patrick will enable your microphone in a second. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, um, I have um, actually two questions. Uh, I suppose all these calculations are done with the G power, right? Yes. Uh, you didn't mention, uh, is it the real space? Uh, all the calculations are plane wave. Uh, calculations okay, in this uh, now I was a little bit uh, wondering about the twisted uh, bilayers. Uh, here you use, I suppose, huge supersets because, I mean, if you twist uh, the die layers, uh, basically are not commensurate with the lattice. Sure. And I was wow. wondering whether you can uh, fold the band structure into the graphene cell to see what is actually the effect of twisting on the electronic structure of graphene, for instance. Mm -hmm. my, my, yeah, yeah uh, I, I, I get the question, but but actually, uh, maybe I wasn't clear on this. Uh, we did not look at twisted homo bilayers. We specifically focused on these aligned homo bilayers to avoid the problem of, of very large uh, supercells. Uh -huh. so, but do you have any idea how to do this kind of uh, calculation with G power or um, twisted? Uh, because, I mean, you, you basically so, highlighted this as right. a, a novel kind of uh, physics uh, that will yeah. be... Yeah. by rotating an angle of the two so, layers. So there is no feature in GPO at the moment that allows you to perform a calculation of a, of a Mares superstructure uh, um, without really representing that entire superstructure. Mm -hmm. right? You have to, to use it. That would be a very expensive calculation. But then you can fold the band structure um, out into the unit cell of, of, of graphene itself afterwards as a post-processing. Yes. Right. So band structure unfolding procedures are, are implemented, I think, in, in ASE. Um, of course, the, uh, the um, LCAO basis set would be much more efficient than the plane wave basis set for performing these large calculations. And it's actually something projects, ongoing projects, uh, looking at more superstructures using that LCAO basis set uh, in GPOL, but, but um, I don't have I don't have any specific results to show you at the moment. I see. Okay, I with, miss, uh, with those, understood you with, with a few hundred um, atoms. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, and uh, we have uh, Lorenzo Bastonero. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, also from my side for the very interesting talk. I was, I mean, I was amazed by the nice results of GW. I think it's uh, quite astonishing. But uh, so, I mean, the next step would be maybe to go for beta cell beta equation. Is it uh, in uh, your plans? And uh, do you think uh, it will work also as well? Mm. Or do you think that also the, yeah, it's, that the Coulomb interaction is a bit harder to describe? Yeah, it, it, it seems very natural. Like if you've done GW, then to do the, the BSE afterwards. But, but of course, this is... This is kind of a spectrum. Uh, the GW uh, correction is, 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 is a scalar, is a number that you, that you put on there. I think um, predicting spectra is, is probably more difficult. I know that uh, uh, Patrick Rinke has, has done some work on predicting um, CDDFT spectra, I think, um, from more basic features. But as you can hear, uh, I haven't thought too deeply about it at the moment. It would be extremely interesting to try to do something like that. I mean, we did try at some point to estimate exits on binding energies from BSE for these 2D materials um, from different electronic features. And, and we did that with some success, but, uh, but the project was not really uh, conclusive and we haven't published anything on it. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting question. And, and again, uh, sorry, I don't have a better answer. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lorenzo. And uh, uh, Christian, I also have a question uh, uh, with sort of uh, half of my heart uh, that is uh, in material science, uh, while the other half is in 
well, maybe more electronic structure. Uh, and uh, that is, you know, thermodynamics is always very difficult to predict. You know, we have great successes in predicting a lot of properties, but thermodynamics has to do with, you know, materials in different coordination, uh, vibrational entropies, and, and so on and so forth. So I was wondering, uh, you know, when you look at the you know, you, you often mentioned the, the convex hull stability. Mm -hmm. Do you actually calculate that with respect uh, to, say, 3D bulk compounds or uh, with other 2D materials uh, where they, these uh, monolayers could go into? That yeah. is, what are your reference states? The reference at the moment is um, essentially OQMD. Uh, so we've, we, okay. we have the OQMD materials and they've got them done with, with PBE. Um, yeah. And then we've done one-shot calculations with GPO, yeah. not with relaxations, one-shot calculations. And that would mean, for example, if you take a layered material that van der Waals interactions are not included. So we would have a 2D monolayer lying exactly on the convex hull because it would have exactly the same energy as the bulk when yeah. you do not include the fender valves. So that, that's a limitation no. uh, currently, but yeah. And then as you mentioned, uh, finite uh, temperature effects, I think also for these bilayers existing in different stacking configurations, those are relatively small um, energy differences, obviously where finite temperature effects could be important. So I think that that's an area where, where it's sort of, could be very interesting to try to apply some of these methods like self-consistent phonons and and uh, what what we have to predict free energies um yeah. no yeah. thanks uh, thanks and then maybe then i have a last question that is more a uh, future looking uh, that is i think uh, you know i mean it's a uh, trivial to say but there has been a uh, you know extremely exciting uh, science uh, that has come from the world of two-dimensional materials uh, now, and you know, it's a question I ask myself also, but uh, if one were, you know, to bet uh, on what technologies uh, could come out, uh, you know, maybe not now, but in 10 years now, someone asks you after uh, whatever, a pint in a pub uh, to make a bet, uh, what, where do you think, uh, you know, 2D materials, heterostructures, you know, some of this multi-layer that you mentioned, uh, have an impact. Uh, where where would your bet be? That's a good question, Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean, electronics is an obvious is an obvious uh, uh, bet. I would say. I mean, there are two D materials with fairly good mobility properties, and they are the challenges, of course, mainly on the experimental side to learn to to grow those materials with high enough in high enough quality, encapsulate them. Uh, contact them. I think those are a little bit engineering issues that um, that could potentially be be solved. And then there is about scaling it up, of course. Uh, but I think electronics, like low power consumption electronics, uh, highly compact electronics, is 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 one area. Um, photo detectors, like ultra thin photo detectors, could be another could be another area. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, of course, you know, all of this is recorded. Uh, so in 10 years from now, <laughs> we can go back uh, and sort of, you know, discuss uh, uh, indeed, uh, you know, if it was uh, really good. Uh, let, let, let me hear what, you, what your bet is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay, yeah, in, in some ways, uh, maybe opto, you know, flexible electronics, uh, opto electronics and, uh, you know, flexible devices. Uh, yeah, I would uh, I would tend uh, to to guess. Uh, yeah, I okay. So uh, let's let's do this. Uh, so we we have <laughs> double reasons uh, to come uh, to come uh, yes. to come back and see what has uh, what has happened. Yeah, good, great. Uh, so that was a great pleasure, Christian. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Sorry yeah. we didn't have you in person, but you have also an open invitation to come whenever and uh, visit us here. Yes, I would love to do so. Yeah. Okay. So. And thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. And the uh, next appointment uh, May third uh, with Claudia Felser, May second. Good. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thanks again.